So the purpose of this tutorial is to talk about not only how to build a synth voice in Zoya, but why you use the components that you use. There was a question that came in on Reddit a few weeks ago where someone said, I followed the tutorial that Empress published and I could make a synth voice, but I didn't know why I was doing what I was doing. So this isn't for someone who's an advanced synthesis. This isn't for someone who's, you know, messed around a lot in modular, but maybe someone who picked up a Zoya uh, and is primarily a guitarist or some other instrumentalist who thought, I'm curious about this synth stuff or who has some experience with synths, but doesn't really know how they work or how the components fit together. Um, so the, the idea behind this tutorial is to talk about the how, but also the, the why, the, the reasons why certain modules work with other modules to produce this thing called a synthesizer. Um, and I'm going to break that up into three parts. The first part, which I'm going to begin with, is called sound generation. There are three parts to synthesis. Sound generation, and we're going to talk about how you make a noise with a synthesizer. The next is control which is how you control that noise. And the third is modulation, which is how you add uh, dynamics and, and uh, excitement to that sound. So I'm gonna jump right into the first part. Uh, a, a synth voice, and, and here I'm talking about, I should say, uh, classic subtractive synthesis, um, which is the type of synthesizer that you find in old analog synthesizers like a Moog uh, or a Roland, um, you know, like the Juno or uh, an Oberheim. Uh, this is a really familiar type of synthesizer. Everyone's heard this type of synthesizer. It's used all over popular music uh, going back 40, 50 years, um, and it's still very popular today. So, <coughs> That said, that's not the only type of synthesis there is, and there are others that are worth exploring in which uh, Zoya can help you explore. But let's start with the subtractive synth voice, and it begins with uh, an oscillator. And one thing I want you to keep in mind about an oscillator is that it is a harmonically rich sound source. So what I have set up here this is a sawtooth oscillator. I'm going to change the frequency a little bit, uh, just so it's a little bit higher in pitch. This is a sawtooth oscillator, and when I turn this patch on, we'll be able to hear it. Now, the sawtooth oscillator is often referred to as buzzy. Right? It's got the sound to it. And that is because it is a harmonically rich sound source. And what I mean by that is that we have a fundamental frequency, which is the, the lowest frequency. It's usually the loudest frequency uh, in the waveform. But if we broke a sawtooth down, we could compose it out of <coughs> other harmonics that occur at other volumes. Um, so the second harmonic is usually one octave above. And then there's one that's an octave and a fifth. And they keep going on and on and on. And when you add all of those up, it creates the sound of a sawtooth. Um, we can look at what a sawtooth would look like if it was made out of sine waves. And sine waves don't contain any of these harmonics. They aren't a harmonically rich sound source. So here we have our sawtooth. <laughs> I'm just going to quickly change that into a sine wave, and all we will hear is the fundamental. I don't know if that's coming through. It's pretty... It's pretty low frequency, because a D3 is a pretty low frequency, and that's all we're hearing. We're not hearing any of these overtones, or as they're sometimes called, partials. So we begin subtractive, synth subtractive synthesis with a harmonically rich sound source. Um, like a sawtooth, square waves are also commonly employed. 
triangle waves less so, although they have more harmonic uh, structure than a sine wave does. And the reason why I want to break into this theory is because it helps us understand the next part. We have a harmonically rich sound source. And the next part is where the subtractive element of subtractive synthesis comes into play. So after my oscillator, I want to put in a filter. And I want to put in a low-pass filter. Now there are several different types of filters. The low-pass filter is the one most commonly used in subtractive synthesis. Um, and what I'm going to do here is just break my connection to the output that I have with the oscillator. I'm going to connect the oscillator to the input of the filter, and then the filter I'm going to connect to the output of the patch. When we turn it on again, we don't hear anything at all. <coughs> and this is because what a filter does in a subtractive synth synthesizer is just like a synthesizer, if we look here, we have a frequency, right? This is the frequency that the fundamental note sounds at. We also have a frequency on our filter. And what that is is called a cutoff frequency. And what it does is it filters everything above it. So if our uh, oscillator's frequency here is at a D3, the cutoff frequency for our uh, state variable filter is way off the board here. And what it's doing is everything above, below that frequency, it passes just fine in a low pass filter. And then everything above it, it starts to filter out along a slope. And if we turn this on again and increase the volume, we may be able to hear, I'm turning up the volume pretty loud on my monitors. I don't know. You can just barely make out that fundamental frequency. It sounds a lot like a sine wave. <laughs> what I'm going to do now is <laughs> change this cutoff frequency. And as I move it forward, more and more of these partials are going to be introduced. And their amplitude is going to be heard more, more loudly. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to go pretty slowly. So now the, the fundamentals coming in. are being passed by the filter. As we open the filter up, it gets pretty loud. But it's called a subtractive synthesizer because you can use a filter to subtract some of this harmonic content. So that's the next part of our, of our filter, of our synth voice. We have a harmonically rich uh, oscillator, and we pair that with a filter that we can use to shape that harmonic content. Then the third part is a VCA. And what the VCA does <coughs> is, if I turn this back on, we have this sound, but the sound plays continuously right? It, oscillators just oscillate. That's what they do. They, they just oscillate. They produce noise. They produce noise at a certain pitch, but, but their only job is to go, Buh, you know, like that one is doing. I, I hope you appreciate my wonderful ability to impersonate the sound of an oscillator. And all the filter can do is just filter out that harmonic content. Now, as you turn the filter way down, you can make it quieter. Uh, but in certain settings, that's, that's not always true. If we had a lower pitch, that might not be true. What a VCA does, let me see, 
is it sort of acts as a gatekeeper and it regulates the volume of what comes through. So right now we have this output going uh, from our filter into our output. I'm going to break that connection. I'm going to connect the output of the filter to the input of the VCA. And then I'm going to connect the output of the VCA to the output of the patch. And again, we don't hear anything. That's because the VCA is closed. Uh, this is referred to. I don't have VCA quite in the picture. <laughs> but it's closed. So if we think of this as sort of a, a gate, right, that's been closed over the sound, it's closed all the way. And we can start raising it uh, like a gate or a garage door. I, I like the analogy of a water faucet um, because you can have it you know, closed all the way, or you can let a little trickle out. Or you can let all of the sound that's behind the VCA out. But the really important job that a VCA does is that it provides silence. Um, you know, so imagine you had a piano and it played all the notes that you wanted whenever you held your fingers over the keys without touching them. It just started making noise. That wouldn't be great. It'd be a cacophony. It would be, you know, these drones. And don't get me wrong, drones are good, but we want to be able to control when we have silence as well. And that's what a VCA allows us to do. So what it does is it opens or raises in level when we press our key so that all of this harmonically rich filtered sound that's behind it can pass through. Um, and those are the, the three major components of a classic subtractive synth voice. A harmonically rich oscillator, a filter to help sculpt or mold that harmonic content, and then a VCA to regulate the volume uh, uh, that is produced by that content and to introduce silence when we want there to be silence. So that's part one, the, the sound synthesis part. The next part we're going to talk about is control. So the second part of this conversation involves discussing how to control these elements that we discussed in sound design, where we have our harmonically rich oscillator, uh, our filter, and our VCA. And we're going to discuss two control signals that are produced. Now I have a keyboard module here with some keys set up. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this with a keyboard module, but keep in mind these principles could be applied to a MIDI note in module. Uh, they could be applied to a pitch detector and an envelope follower. Uh, the, the ideas are, are really about how you control any sort of synth voice. These two elements are going to be a part of it. Um, so the first increases in CV equals a semitone. And the more familiar you are with, with uh, Zoya, the, the more familiar these values will be. But what we really need to know is that these different values relate to different fundamental pitches of our oscillator. So when we connect the node out to the oscillator, we can produce different pitches, different note values at the oscillator too. So each time I press the note on the keyboard, I also see that reflected in the oscillator frequency. And since the last video, one thing that I, I did do was that I biased this oscillator back to A0, which is the beginning of Zoya's pitch scale. Um, anything that you add to a, a, an input, uh, or any connections that are made at an input, or, or 
and input is biased to will be added together. So when I had this set before to D3, it would add D3 to all of these notes and pitch them up. So I wanted to make sure that was set back to A0 so that they would all reflect the notes that I had on my keyboard. Okay, so I'm playing notes, but I don't hear anything. And that's because I haven't connected uh, my gate to my VCA. But before I do that, I'll just show, I'm gonna open my VCA manually. Right? So as I change the, the note value, the oscillator changes its frequency and we hear different pitches, uh, different notes being played. So the gate of the keyboard module goes to the VCA. And a gate signal, the fundamental frequency changes. The, the note changes <laughs> because we're using different notes. We want to be able to change the frequency. Gates are different. They are simple on-off signals for sound. So if this goes between 0 and 1, a gate is either 0 or 1. And unfortunately, I can't show that because as I press the keyboard module, it, it won't demonstrate that. If we look at the key, keyboard out, gate out when I'm not pressing anything, it shows us a value of 0. Um, and when I start to press things, we'll see it lights up. And what it's doing is sending a value of 1. <clears throat> and it sends that value of 1 for as long as I press this key. Like I talked about that, that piano that we wanted to be able to press the key to produce a sound. The same thing happens with a gate. When we connect it to the VCA, it only opens whenever we press a key and it allows that harmonically rich filtered sound that we've created to pass. There, there are other control uh, elements that can come into play with a uh, synthesizer. There's, you know, some controllers produce velocity or uh, aftertouch, which is sometimes called channel pressure. Um, there are the, the keyboard module itself has another output that, that's hidden off this board for a trigger. And, and all of those can be used in different ways, but the, the classic subtractive synthesizer depends on these two uh, control signals being sent. A note, uh, which controls the fundamental frequency, and a gate, which tells the, the synth when to allow noise to, to pass or sound to pass and when to be quiet. So those are the, the basic control signals. Uh, the next section is modulation and modulation is where things get real wild. Okay. So in the last section we talked about the two control signals that help us uh, change a drone, a droning note or pure silence if our VCA is closed into something where we can play notes when we press a key, specific notes when we press a key. And we use a, a note value to, to tell the oscillator what note to play and we use a, a gate to tell the VCA what to play. Uh, or when to open, rather. This section is on modulation, and I'm going to begin with a big caveat, which is that modulation is a virtually endless uh, subject. Uh, it, it is full of different options and different approaches. Uh, I would not, by any means, attempt to be anywhere near exhaustive. And this whole tutorial is not exhaustive, uh, but this is a place in particular where I have to, to pick what I show. And for the rest of it, I'm going to say, try stuff out. <laughs>
Modulation is where synths really come alive. It's where they become dynamic and evolving and changing. And so it's a place where you can really try different stuff out uh, and see what you think of it. Um, but I'm going to go through a, a couple of basic types of modulation and some of the applications that you might have for them. Um, the first one is an ADSR. That's what the module is called in Zoya. Uh, these are often called envelopes or contour generators, less commonly. Um, and an ADSR is an envelope. What it does is it shapes uh, a signal, a control signal, uh, along a sort of set shape that has four basic components in the classical sense. There's an attack time, which determines how long that signal takes to reach its maximum value. There's a decay time, which determines how long it takes to fall back to a sustain level, which is a percentage of this total level. And then there is a release time, that is how long it takes to fall back to zero uh, once the, the signal ends. So if we think of it, here's one. Sorry, I lopped off the top of this peak, but it should just stop right there. Imagine I'm a good artist when you watch these videos. And then there's zero at the bottom. There are a lot of different applications for this. I'm going to talk about uh, two of them. The first is for our, our VCA. If you notice, we can turn our notes on whenever we press this key, but they just go on and off. You know, it's not a very dynamic sound. It's not a very expressive sound. So instead of connecting our gate directly to our VCA, I'm going to disconnect them now. I can connect it to the input of this ADSR. And this is just the stock ADSR. I loaded it up without changing any of the, the options. There are a lot of options for the ADSR module. Um, some of them can produce very different results. Uh, but, you know, try them out, see what you think. The basic idea is always the same, which is that it produces a signal that contours or shapes uh, incoming CV. Uh, the, the ways in which those options play out can, can produce very different results depending on what you're looking for. So, you know, I encourage you to explore there. <clears throat> and what this is going to do is instead of opening our gate on and off, I mean, the gate will still open on and off, but what the VCA will receive is a signal that begins to rise. Instead of just going on and off, it'll rise over time, then it'll fall a little bit, and then it'll hold at a steady volume. And then when I release the note, there'll be uh, a, a period of time where it goes from this steady volume back to zero. And with the stock settings, that may not be... may not be very apparent. But we can also exaggerate these a little bit. So as I increase the attack time, I'll have more of a fade into my note. See, it takes longer to reach its full volume. And it also makes the decay and sustain stage sound a little bit more apparent. So we hear it swell up and then it falls back a little bit and holds it a volume. I'm going to extend the decay stage too. And it takes a little bit longer to reach that volume that it holds at. And we can adjust that volume too. We can turn it down so the note holds but is quieter when it when it holds and it'll hold as long as I hold down that note. You can also turn it up and this as we turn up the sustain stage 
the decay stage won't be as apparent because there's less difference between the the top of the attack time and the sustain level. It doesn't drop as far. So we might not hear the decay stage quite as distinctly. Then we can extend the release too. I put that in for longer than I planned. Seven seconds is a long time for a release, but sometimes you want a long release. Uh, the the other side of that, you know, I'm showing these at long times because it's easier to hear the differences, but you can also use the ADSR uh, to make sounds sharper too. So, you know, for instance, we can bring down our release and bring down our sustain or turn off our sustain stage. If we turn it to zero, Get a very short sound and because the sustain volume is set to zero it doesn't matter how long I hold the note uh, so the sustain stage only you know matters if there if there's a, a, a set volume to it otherwise it'll be bypassed so you know, you can play around with these. Um, so that's one common application for an ADSR. A lot of synthesizers will also have an ADSR for a filter. And in fact, it's more common to have an ADSR for a filter than it is for a VCA. There are some older synths where the VCA is just a, a gate. It's on off. And the filter is used largely to give uh, the dynamic sound to uh, the synthesizer. So what I'm going to do now is disconnect this from the VCA. I'm going to reconnect the gate output from, to the VCA. So again, when we press a note, it will hold open. Um, and then I'm going to connect. First, I'm going to take the the filter frequency down and I'm going to connect the output of the ADSR to the filter instead of the VCA. And this is where we start to hear some of the, the classic filter sounds is when you sweep the, the filter's frequency with an ADSR. You know, we're, we're getting into the territory of stuff that, that sounds properly synthy, I would say. Um, and we can make those noises, those sounds, more synthy by increasing the resonance of our filter. And resonance is just, it, it, it is a point at the cutoff frequency where the gain of the, the frequency is increased. So what it does is it accentuates that cutoff frequency. Um, and as you move the, the filter frequency, it, it creates a... Uh, well, you'll you'll hear it in a second. It's pretty distinctive, right? Um, those sort of vocal qualities of a synthesizer voice. And again, we can change the behavior. We can put in. Sustain. We won't hear the release stage because I'm using a gate. So the, the gate will close before we hear the release stage. Right, we can hear the sustain stage. Now... I wanted to zero out the, the filter uh, back to its minimum frequency because the, the next part of this involves um, what I call min-maxing 
uh, which is setting a minimum range for modulation and then a maximum range for modulation. And real quickly, I'm going to disconnect the filter again, because maybe we don't want something quite so dramatic, right? You know, when it when the filter opens all the way and then back, it, it's a pretty distinctive noise uh, or sound, and, and maybe you want something that's a little subtler. The way that you achieve that is through min maxing. So. I'm going to find a filter frequency that I like as my minimum frequency. That seems pretty good to me. I can hear all the notes pretty distinctly, but they're kind of muffled. Um, and then I'm going to reconnect the ADSR. If I connect it at 100%, the filter is actually going to exceed the highest frequency of or the, the signal will exceed the highest frequency of, of the filter. So I want to attenuate it uh, quite a bit and get something that doesn't move across as much of the filter's frequency. It moves across a narrower range. And even that's a little bit more than I want. So by setting the, the base frequency that I wanted, I'm setting the minimum, the minimum range for the, the, the filter, the ADSR to sweep, because this is what the filter will sound like if no modulation is applied to it. It'll, the, the filter will, will continue to operate it at about 400 hertz. I'm going to round up a little bit here. Um, but what I'm doing when I attenuate this connection between the ADSR and the filter is I'm setting the maximum. I'm determining how large its range will be. And I can make that really small. Or I can make that much larger. So when you're creating modulation, you want to think about what the, the minimum range that you want that modulation to go to is, and then what the maximum range that modulation is. And there are uh, uh, different ways to approach this. I, I think at first, you know, just start doing it by ear. On the tips and tricks page, I have uh, some examples of some more advanced ways to approach uh, setting minimums and maximums and I also published a patch uh, a couple months ago called utility pages where I use some of the more sophisticated methods of, of setting modulation ranges but you know when you're just starting out it, it's perfectly fine to do this stuff by ear and if you start saying you know why am I not hearing modulation if it seems like you, you should be hearing modulation and you aren't you might want to check this uh, percentage because, as I said, if we turn this up, we won't hear much modulation because one has been pushed down to like here, right? So all of this, this other part of the ADSO, ADSR's curve occurs above uh, the value of one, and Zoya has no way of interpreting stuff that happens above one, other than as one. One's its maximum. One's the the speed limit, the hard threshold. You can't exceed it. Um, and so modulating above that won't produce any change. Uh, it'll just produce a static value of one until the modulation falls back below one. Um, so that's the, the ADSR. There's one other, you know, you, here we can also modulate pitch, which I really want to attenuate if I do. And I'll show you why I... Right, if you don't attenuate it, you get sort of... It's 
good for sound effects, I guess, but it's not all that musical. It's, to me, you know, kind of obnoxious. But this is also commonly used in, in percussive sounds uh, to create bass drums that have a little bit of a, a, a pitch increase or, or toms. So you can also apply an ADSR or any modulation source to any of these destinations. I really shouldn't speak as though these are the only three places you could put them. You could also send an ADSR to Resonance. You could, at this point, those are the only four locations we have to modulate, but you can modulate all sorts of things. Um, anyhow, I'm gonna stop showing this. <sighs> But you can send it, you can use an ADSR on pitch too. I'm going to talk a little bit about the LFO. And there are, are several LFO shapes to choose from. I chose a triangle shape um, because I think it's, it's really easy to hear what a triangle is doing. Uh, here I'm just showing its output. So, you know, it's a triangle shape. It looks like a triangle. It goes from, from one again to zero as long as it's unattenuated. And there's also an option, well, there's a lot of options again in the LFO. I encourage you to play around with them. Uh, I have a video on some of the, the different options for LFOs if you're really interested in looking at, at those. Um, but in the interest of not going crazy, I'm just gonna go ahead and connect this again to our, our filter. I'm going to attenuate it again because we don't want it to go all over the place. If I set this filter frequency, you see as I change this, it's changing the range that the LFO sweeps, right? Right? And I, I put down these two terms here. An LFO is continuous, right? It'll just keep sweeping across that range as long as you'd like. Now there is an option in the LFO to reset the phase, which would cause it to start uh, whenever you press the key. And that's something to keep in mind as you're building your synths. Um, but, you know, normal LFO under normal action whether i'm pressing a key or not we can see it flashing on and off it just keeps doing what it does the adsr is triggered um, and it waits for a gate input or a trigger input before it starts following this this predefined curve let me turn up the sustain level again so when I press the key here, we'll start seeing the output of the ADSR change, right? It lights up, unlike the LFO's output, which just goes all the time. The ADSR waits for a signal to come in before it starts producing uh, its values. But the LFO is a great way to, to add modulation. We can change its rate, make it slow. We can make it fast. And like I said, there are several uh, built-in waveforms for the LFO. There are even more. I'm going to show a ramp, just as a, a ramp, you know, the Triangle is, you know, triangle shaped. A ramp is ramp shaped. Um, <clears throat> there are several different uh, built-in LFO wave shapes. You can adjust their duty cycle and and or their swing. I'm sorry, it's called, and do interesting things to them. There, there are a lot of options for for modulation with LFOs. Right. So we can hear differences there. And again, the LFO can be applied to the oscillator for vibrato, either subtly for a, a little bit of, a, you know, a, 
a drift to the sound that, that can make it sound fuller or wild seasick vibrato. Um, it can be applied to the, to the VCA. Uh, um, and produce, you know, a, a tremolo effect. And this is one of the ways that you can produce a tremolo, uh, you know, like a guitar pedal tremolo, is by using a, an LFO to modulate a, a VCA in Zoya. Um, like I said, there are a lot of different options here. The important thing to keep in mind with, with modulation is that because there are so many options, it really pays off to just play. Um, there aren't really wrong answers. I mean, you can put connections together that don't produce anything or produce a horrible squall. Um, but, you know, because there are so many different options, it really pays off to, to try different things. And, and, you know, if you have the basics down of the synthesis voice and the controls, then the modulation is just sort of a cherry on top. You know, it's a place where you can add your own unique twist to a sound. Uh, it's the place where a synth voice really comes alive. And so, you know, I think it's it's a great place to play around with ideas, to try different things, um, to combine signals. And, and that's the one sort of maybe more advanced thing I'm going to show here, which is, you know, uh, combining an LFO and an ADSR. And we do that with a multiplier. Um, and a multiplier multiplies. Uh, they're, they're both very confusing modules and very simple modules in, in a lot of ways, because all that they do is they multiply, but they multiply numbers that are no more than one. Uh, one being multiplied by one is an identity. Anything less than that is actually kind of like division. You know, if you multiply something by 0.5, you don't get a larger number, you get a smaller one. And when we combine them, what's going to happen is that the, the depth of our LFO is going to increase as our ADSR rises and falls. So it's all going to fit underneath this sort of shape. I'm going to send that to the filter. I'm going to attenuate sending it to the filter. I'm going to stop this connection. I'm going to reconnect the ADSR uh, to the VCA so we can hear the release stage. But it'll sound... Maybe it won't sound like that. I forgot to connect anything to anything. So I want to connect the output of the ADSR to one input of the multiplier, which I've done here. And I want to connect the output of the LFO to the other input of the multiplier. Right now it shows nothing because I haven't used a gate signal. It hasn't been triggered yet. The ADSR hasn't been triggered yet. But when I do, let me use a more dramatic example. If I use a long attack time, we'll hear the depth of the LFO slowly build. Right? So that's one of so many different options. Uh, again, I, I want to leave this kind of open-ended. There are a bunch of different ways you can play around with this. Uh, there's one other that I forgot to show. Just because I, I, I mentioned it in the Reddit post. That is, you can, I, I, you know, I talked about the note output being used to control the pitch of the oscillator. Uh, or the frequency of the oscillator. But our state variable filter also has a frequency. And we can send the same output there. And what that'll do is make sure that the cutoff frequency of the filter tracks uh, the, the keyboard. So the cutoff frequency will always be centered over the node of our oscillator. 
And that helps, um, particularly when you, you talk about adding modulation. The modulation will be pushed up with each higher note, right? So its minimum range will increase. Uh, if I go back to just the LFO, and the 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 benefit there is that the modulation will sound consistent across different note ranges. Because it'll have a different range in relationship to the note being played. Um, the other benefit there is that, that it can help you if you, you know, are playing a, along a keyboard, uh, depending on where the, the cutoff frequency is, certain notes will be uh, much louder and, and heard more distinctly than some higher notes, which will be dull and quiet. Um, and so that, that's just one other modulation source in this pretty limited palette that you can use to, to create different things. Like I said, I'm just, you know, I'll keep rambling here. There's so much to talk about with modulation. Uh, but, you know, explore stuff. Use one LFO to modulate the rate of another LFO. Use an ADSR like this to to control the depth of an LFO. Use a, a, an ADSR to control another ADSR. Uh, you know, set up different ADSRs for your VCA and your filter. It's very common. Uh, so that you can have different types of expressiveness where your filter opens quickly, but your VCA is slower and vice versa and all these other things. There's no set playbook for modulation. Every subtractive synthesizer has an oscillator, a filter, and a VCA. That's common. Every subtractive synthesizer uses some sort of pitch uh, information or, or node information and uses a, a gate unless it's a drone synth but it the ones that you play on a keyboard that, that you know like a, a Moog that you you know you think of blah 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 that uses a gate those things are common modulation is where similarities you know go a bunch of different ways there are a bunch of different approaches to envelopes there are different approaches to LFOs and how they're triggered and, and all of that stuff. So again, it's it's a good place to play around, try new things, try different modules, try combinations of modules, you know, get get wacky with it. Um, and, you know, with the, the basic structure of the, the subtractive synthesizer, you can also get wacky. Use more uh, oscillators, use two filters in parallel or, or try band pass filters or high pass filters uh there aren't a lot of varieties for the vca but you know you can try different stuff there too um but you know th there there are a lot of different ways to set up this voice once you have the basic structure in place there are a lot of different ways to play with it uh so Go ahead and play and have fun and try stuff and whatnot. Thank you.